Again, still within confidentiality, as the classic security goal of cryptography, we have reached hybrid encryption. Please remind yourselves about the combined approach of safes and mailboxes in the analog world, which we had a look at in the introduction of the security goal confidentiality. The same approach to combine a symmetric with asymmetric encryption scheme is also taken in cryptography. Prerequisite to participate in such a hybrid encryption scheme is that each participant, and let's again just call her Alice, is required to own a public private key pair, for example, an RSA key pair, which pretty much just demands to Alice having a mailbox with exclusively owning a private key for this mailbox. If Alice now has such a public private RSA key pair and has made the public key publicly available, then Bob, who again, wants to confidentially send Alice a plain text, proceeds as follows. In a first step, Bob just creates a completely new, random, symmetric AES key K of an appropriate length, for example, 128 bits. Bob then uses this new random AES key K to encrypt his plain text, which results in a ciphertext. Bob then takes the public key of Alice and with this public key encrypts the new and randomly generated AES key with RSA, which results in an encrypted key K. Bob then sends both the ciphertext together with the encrypted key to Alice, who then in a first step takes her private RSA decryption key and decrypts the received encrypted key K back into the symmetric AES key K that Bob freshly generated just recently. Having recovered this symmetric AES key K, Alice can then proceed to recover the original plaintext by simply using this AES key to decrypt the received ciphertext with AES back into the plaintext Bob originally sent. This hybrid encryption approach now really combines the best of the two worlds insofar as that only one key pair per participant is required to begin with. Furthermore, the bulk of the data, which is the plain text that can be of an arbitrary size, is encrypted with AES, which sig significantly outperforms RSA in terms of speed. This sounds great and actually is great, but nevertheless, this hybrid encryption approach has one major drawback. I recommend you to briefly pause and to try to figure out for yourself how things in this hybrid encryption approach can possibly go wrong. The main problem within hybrid encryption approaches is that in such an encryption scheme, the security completely relies on the secrecy of the private key of the participant. Although short lifetimes are recommended nowadays, such public private key pairs often have a lifetime of multiple years and over the course of their lifetime are repeatedly used to encrypt the symmetric keys used for the encryption of the order to be confidential plaintext. The longer the lifetime of such a public and private key pair, the more symmetric keys are encrypted with it and once such a public private key pair can be obtained, all the data exchanged on this public private key pair can be recovered. Of course, this requires an adversary to keep a record of all the encrypted data received by a participant with the hope that one day the private key of the participant either is leaked or that algorithms emerge that can calculate private keys from the corresponding public keys. This may seem far-stretched, but it's commonly assumed that large nation-state actors maintain large archives of encrypted internet communication taking place relative to certain participants with the hope to one day possibly being able to decrypt this data. This problem can be solved by using ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and we are just about to see how this works. Ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchanges, abbreviated as EDH, are, besides RSA, the second ingenious cryptographic invention from the 1970s. Diffie-Hellman key exchanges are named after the two US cryptographers and electrical engineers who invented and published the scheme back in 1976. An ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchange 
now allows Alice and Bob to commonly agree on a symmetric encryption key K without this key K ever being on the wire between Alice and Bob, neither in plain nor encrypted, as it was the case with the hybrid encryption scheme. In order for this to work, it is assumed that Alice and Bob, by following a certain protocol, have agreed on using a set of Diffie-Hellman parameters G and P, which are public knowledge available to everyone. The Diffie-Hellman parameters G and P are simply prime numbers, with the prime number P again in the order of at least length 2048 bits. If Alice and Bob now want to derive a symmetric key K that can then be used subsequently to exchange confidential data, then both Alice and Bob in a first step completely by themselves create two secret random numbers that they will keep private. Let's assume the random number Alice creates for herself is X and the random number that Bob creates for himself is Y. Then Alice calculates the power of the public Diffie-Hellman parameter G to X modulo P and sends the result to Bob. Bob does the same with his private number Y, calculating G to the power of Y modulo P and sends the result to Alice. The values that Alice and Bob exchange in this manner are referred to as half keys and based on these half keys, both Alice and Bob can then again calculate the symmetric keys K completely in isolation. Alice, for example, takes the half key B received from Bob and calculates this half key B to the power of her secret X. Looking at the arithmetics, this results in the value G to the power of YX. Bob does a similar calculation based on his secret and looking at the arithmetics involved, we can see that Alice and Bob indeed arrive at the same value, which then they take as a symmetric key to encrypt the data that they will subsequently exchange between them. To repeat, the advantage of this is that the symmetric key K is never on the wire, neither in plain nor encrypted, and that if possibly, one day such a secret X or Y of Alice or Bob would leak, only the one corresponding key K could be calculated, and with it, only the data related to this very specific session could be uncovered. Calculating the symmetric key K is easy and efficient once either X or Y are known, given that Alice and Bob exchange half keys, which both have the X and Y somewhat embedded within them, the security of these Diffie-Hellman key exchanges rely on the assumed difficulty of calculating discrete logarithms. This again is only assumed to be difficult and no publicly known algorithms exist to calculate these discrete logarithms efficiently. This is the ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchange and the nowadays accepted solution to the problem arising from the use of hybrid encryption schemes. A modern version of the ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchange presented just before is the ephemeral elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange, fortunately coming along with an abbreviation ECDHE. At this point, it's not necessary for me to go into the specifics in as much detail as I did for the original Diffie-Hellman key exchange, as the concept is exactly the same, with the difference being that the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange now operates on different mathematical entities known as elliptic curves. The assumed to be difficult problem that ECDHE relies on is then also not just the plain discrete logarithm problem, but the discrete logarithm problem for elliptic curves. Broadly speaking, the reason elliptic curve-based cryptographic primitives are now gaining in popularity is due to the fact that many of these primitives achieve the same level of security with much smaller keys involved. The classic Diffie-Hellman key exchange, for example, involves numbers with lengths in the order of thousands of bits, whereas the elliptic curve equivalent involves numbers in the order of just hundreds of bits. <laughs>